Hello, this is uh, Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind. You know, today I have the lovely co-host, Sherry Nakamura, who is going to be asking our wonderful guest from the beat in Berkeley, Roger Dillahunty. And of course, the show is talk about dancing in, into the studio because Roger has had such a long-term career in dance. And of course, Sherry has had two. And so uh, this should be an interesting conversation about dance. And I will be asking um, Roger some biographical questions and Sherry will, I'll leave it to Sherry to, to talk about dance because she's the expert. So um, Roger, tell us about your journey. I, you know, I know you grew up, you grew up in Southern California because I went to high school with you. So, um, you know, tell us about your journey in Santa Monica and then, uh, you know, going to the Bay Area and how you got involved with dance. Well, uh, thank you, first of all, Carl, uh, for having me here. And it's uh, really wonderful meeting you, Sherry. Um, well, in Santa Monica, I actually was more into music, as you know. We both were in choir together. And so it wasn't until um, I actually moved to the Bay Area that I actually started to get involved in dancing. And um, so, but my... Uh, my experience with dance started even before I, was, I lived in Southern California. When I was in Arkansas as a child, um, this was in the 50s, I would uh, listen to these vinyl records that my mother and my aunt would play. I would listen to music and I would dance around. And, and even in school, you know, I, um, I uh, danced and we had contests and we had uh, productions. And so... Those are my early experiences with dancing, and I fell in love with dancing. But it wasn't until I moved to uh, to the Bay Area that I decided I wanted to take dance. Um, Sherry, we mentioned a person, a mentor of mine, Cecilia Martha. Mm -hmm. uh, I met Cecilia Martha and her sister Elvia uh, at a party, and they were so they were so inspirational to me. It, it I kind of left my body when I danced with them. And uh, at the end of the party, there was a person who came up and said, oh, wow, you guys are such beautiful dancers. And I said, no, I'm not a dancer. They're the dancers. And they both looked and said, baby, you are a dancer also. <laughs> so that was the beginning of me really, really um, having the, the bug for dancing bite me. But it wasn't until... Uh, a couple of years later that I actually started to take formal training. My first classes were at Laney College where I started a modern dance class. And, um, and then I started taking some jazz and ballet. And I decided I wanted to further uh, my teaching experience and training. So I went to the College of Alameda. And all of this happened in 1976. And between 76 and 78, I did some intense training. Um, I ended up being like the TA for all the dance instructors who were on staff at the College of Alameda. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was, that was how I got sort of my formal teaching training. You know, I had mentors that were wonderful. You know, one of my teachers was uh, a dancer. She went on to do course line. She was in the National Company for Course Line. So this was all in between 1976 and uh, 1978. Then in uh, that same time frame, I got involved with a group called the Planet of Dance. And this was my first professional job where I got paid. And the Planet of Dance was actually um, a program that went into the schools. We did, uh, we did assemblies in the different schools around the Bay Area. And we would teach children the similarities and the differences between the dis different dance forms, you know, like comparing ballet and it's, it's cousin, uh, modern, and it is weird cousin modern, they called it. And then there are distance cousin jazz. And then they had these distant relatives, which was the African dancing and also the classical Indian dancing. And of course, we had a child that was the same age as those children who were the person who took us on that journey to the planet of dance. And that was a wonderful uh, segue for me to start my teaching. So I started teaching children and uh, I taught in over 40 schools all over the Bay Area. And 
that's the beginning of my dancing. Well, I'm, you know, I'm going to let Sherry, our co-host, ask you questions about dance now, because uh, as I said, she's an expert. And, you know, what I didn't say is that, you know, Sherry danced on Broadway. So, you know, she's the perfect person to um, ask Roger questions. Well, thank you, Carl, for this opportunity. And Roger, even in that short snippet, I, I do have a number of questions. So um, myself included, I didn't start um, taking ballet as a child, but I realized, or I came to know when I went to New York to study that um, it is foundational. Um, Cause I was a jazz dancer. My era was the Michael Jackson era and I wanted to dance in music videos. Uh, and so I started there, but then I went back and uh, studied ballet as well as um, some contemporary. So I had to sort of backtrack and it sounds like you did that a little bit too. Um, was that difficult for you to go from sort of a free uh, movement genre to a more strict genre uh, in the classical, you know, dancing uh, uh, structure? Yes, it definitely was because uh, I had no idea what it entailed. You know, I didn't have the flexibility. I started very late. I was 23 when no. I was dance. So, um, yes, it was very difficult in the beginning, you know, acquiring uh, a level of technical skills. Mm. That was one of the things that was really, really difficult for me, you know. Um, but I fell in love with it. So, uh, you know, even though there were hard times, there were struggles, it was a challenge and I rose to the, to the occasion. Right, right. So you must have had pretty um, amazing teachers and mentors along the way that gave you some encouragement, um, specifically because you were a late starter. And maybe you can talk about some of those teachers who um, influenced you and uh, and helped you along. Yes, let me think back. The first teacher I had was Joan Sagata. She was a black belt in karate. Her uh, husband was uh, the karate instructor at the College of Alameda. She was a strict uh, disciplinary. I mean, she I, I couldn't do any of the things that she did in the beginning. It was very, very challenging and difficult. But uh, she was a wonderful mentor in that she was um, nurturing, you know. Right. And so and very, very encouraging. And she was the person that really helped me when I, I, I had my first major dance injury. It was through her that I was able to get and seek the uh, the medical uh, help that I needed to help me get through that. Uh, I also had a wonderful teacher, Pam Drake. I told you mm -hmm. she was um, one of the dancers that she danced with, uh, Dance Between the Lines, which was a, a professional show that was being held in San Francisco. Uh, Anne-Marie Garvin was the choreographer. And uh, Pam Drake, was really instrumental in helping me to become a teacher. She was really a mentor. I mean, um, I acquired a lot of skills through her. And she later on went to do course live with uh, another dear friend of mine, Woodrow Thompson, who was in the international company. But I also worked with, uh, with there was uh, Yvonne Daniels, who was, um, who did the uh, Donham technique. So I did Donham technique through Yvonne Daniels. Mm -hmm. Eleanor Barnes, who was um, a jazz instructor, I took through her. Uh, uh, Naima Gwen Lewis, who uh, was, I think she's in Washington, D.C. now. She was also very instrumental in, in helping me and was a wonderful mentor. Um, and I also got to, as later on, when I acquired more technique and started mm -hmm. to get experience as a performer, I started to work with more renowned teachers and oh. choreographers, and there's a whole list of those. Right. So, Carl, you may imagine that in the dance world, right, we come across these artists and we can learn from them and build our own artistry through the influence of others. Um, I'm kind of interested about your performing career. It sounds like you had a performing career and also a teaching career, and probably, I'm assuming, you're also a choreographer. So maybe you can speak a little bit about your performing career, maybe um, 
what was the most, um, I don't know, euphoric experience or a memorable experience in your performing career? Uh, we'll start with that. Well, I, I, I have had a lot of uh, opportunities to perform. Uh, there are a lot of highlights. Uh, and for example, in 1983, I had the uh, opportunity to do the University Odd Games up in Edmonton, Canada. So that was a wonderful experience for me because it was, uh, I got the opportunity to choreograph the show that we were presenting. It was uh, uh, through a theater arts group out of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And we went up for the games for the week that was held in Edmonton. Uh, but also that following year in 84, I was a part of the Olympics Arts Festival in Los Angeles. And so we performed down in Japantown. That was a wonderful highlight. And the same year I went to um, Martinique where uh, my choreography was featured in the opening number for an international festival in Martinique. And that same summer I had the opportunity to travel uh, throughout Germany and went throughout uh, Europe and later on had the opportunity to do uh, workshops in Berlin, workshops in, in Vienna, in Austria. Um, I did a decade of performing up at, in Juno, Alaska, through Juno Unlimited, which is a dance company that would host uh, guest artists from all over the, the states. Right. And uh, so I had the opportunity to go there for almost for over a decade, and that was wonderful. Have you been to Juno? I, I've never been to Juno, no. So, yeah. So I have a whole list of, of, of uh, performance experiences. Uh, I also got the opportunity to work with Alonzo King. Mm -hmm. I was uh, a member of a six-member dance company called uh, City Center Dance Theater. And we danced together for about 10 years. Um, originally, there were six of us. Uh, later on, we opened the company up for other members to join in. And that's who I went to Martinique with. Mm -hmm. um, but Alonzo King set a piece on our company. I got the opportunity to work with Diane McIntyre out of New York. Mm -hmm. Donald McHale, um, Tally Beatty, who set a piece on us. Um, so I've, I've had a number of wonderful experiences. It it sounds like it. It sounds like it. Now let me let me just interrupt here uh, just for a second, sure. Sherry. Sorry, um, Roger, because uh, Sherry eloquently talked about your teaching part of your career also, and I'm very interested in how you um, establish your studio. And you know, I've heard stories from Sherry about how difficult it is to be in the arts, and of course, she made her career in New York city and was, you know, and, and actually, you know, was able to make it as a, as an artist and as a dancer. But my question is, how did you start the beat? And I want to, uh, you know, if you go into your wonderful studio, there's a picture of Gregory Hines and you later told me in conversation, cause I just happened to ask about uh, an old friend of mine, someone who I knew as an undergraduate at Berkeley, she was in law school. I was an undergraduate named Fonda Davis, Angela Davis' sister. And, um, and you said that both, both women are have frequented your, your, the beat studio. So I'm, I'm curious about your following, um, on Sherry's, uh, fine question about your teaching, but more, more importantly, how you establish this business. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, for me, it was, it was kind of a hard transition to go from being a, a teaching artist to a business person. <laughs> it has some experience because as an independent contractor, most dancers are independent contractors. As an independent contractor, I had to know where my money was going and where it was coming from. And so I had to establish a, a way of being able to do finances and, and that. But I also uh, got a lot of training through the Julie Morgan um, in, uh, in Berkeley that did collaborative work with the Lincoln Institute out of New York. And so I got to learn a methodology of, of teaching that not only enhance my teaching as a teaching artist in the schools with the children, but also with adults and also credential mm -hmm. teachers. So I got to do that collaboration. But the uh, but through them, I also got experience of being able to facilitate 
And so that allowed me to be able to see that I could run a dance studio. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult because that 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 change from uh, the teaching artist to a business person took a lot. So uh, what I had to do, and I have a list of things because I won't remember everything. Um, let's see. The structure of put the uh, studio together, of course, one has to get a business license. Uh, you have to have an employee identification number, which is the E, the E-I-N. And now I think California causes the U-E-I, which is the unique uh, entity identifier. Um, we, you also have to have a fictitious, fictitious, I can't even say it, business name for uh, an emission statement. So I created a mission statement. Um, and I also had to get a 1023 form filing. I had to get the RS 501 C3, which, you know, my, my studio is, a is a nonprofit, uh, had to get the state of California department of justice, a letter from them. Um, we had to get, uh, an SOS, which is the social, uh, secretary of state, a letter from the secretary of state. Uh, management record fees, liability insurance. So all of those were the technical aspects of putting together uh, the business. But the history itself didn't start with the beat, the Berkeley Performing Arts. Originally, the studio was known as Studio J. And Studio J was actually started by a woman named Joan, Joan Flint. And Studio J was actually her initial. And John hired me to come in to be one of the first jazz instructors. Mm -hmm. And um, she was lovely. And, but she only had the studio for three years. She passed away in 88, but this was 85 when I started. So the studio went from Studio J and it was run after she passed away uh, by two ladies. Um, up until 1999. In 99, it became the beat, Eddie Brown Center of the Arts. Now, Eddie Brown Center of the Arts was run by a woman named Babs Yohai, who was also uh, friends with, with uh, cause Carl mentioned um, Gregory Hines. She was also friends with Gregory Hines and Gregory Hines had frequent Studio J a number of times. Yeah. He would do master classes, but they were in-house master classes. It wasn't open to the public. So mm -hmm. only students and teachers at the at Studio J in the beginning were able to attend. And later on, the beat any mm -hmm. Brown the Arts. And in 2006, I became the manager of Eddie Brown Center of the Arts. And as the manager, I came in and there were some priorities that the owner at the time wanted to oversee to bring the studio up. This was, I think, during the beginning of the dot-com crisis. Mm -hmm. So a lot, there were a lot of closures. A lot of studios were just mm -hmm. falling like dominoes. In fact, during those years, I lost a lot of my work. You know, 25 years at a, a school, Cabrillo Elementary School, 10 years at the Japanese bilingual school, tough it's uh, the C third wave. All of those studios closed. It, uh, the C City Center Dance Theater. Uh, a lot of places had um, the problems where they couldn't keep up with their rents and stuff like that. So a lot of things changed. So becoming a manager was a segue for me to get more experience in my business. And in twenty oh eight. I took over and then that's when I went in and I, as I mentioned before, I got my business license, I got incorporated, you know, and we got our, our nonprofit status that same year and we became the beat, the Berkeley Performing Arts. So as of 2008 to present, that's where we stand. And, you know, just to a follow-up comment that I'm going to let um, Sherry um, ask another question. And that is, you know, uh, you had mentioned to me when we talked about this interview that, you know, you had to figure out how you were going to, you know, uh, um, uh, not be at the beads because you had classes going on. So we're really grateful for your 
uh, attendance here, Roger, and this this um uh, uh you, you being here and and answering questions. And before I get to Sherry, I want to also mention that you know your career in music also because you share that with Sherry um, was quite significant. And I think you're very very modest about the qu your choir experience at Santa Monica High School because <laughs> of course sitting near you was Jubilant Sykes, who's gone on and had a wonderful um, singing career. And you know people had you know many people had not me of course, but Many people had perfect pitch in that, um, in that uh, giant I had choir, and pitch too. <laughs> <laughs> and you and Stella Gray and uh, other people, um, you know, had really good pitch. And um, I have to make this comment. It's a personal aside. Is that I was always very happy because you're also very kind to um, um, a, who, someone who is Elizabeth Hicks now, but was uh, Tootie Ackerman at the time. And you're always so kind to Tootie. So uh, Sherry. Well, no, I don't. It's not that. Um... I don't have any questions on the top of my head, but I just want to make a comment. I know how difficult it is to maintain a dance studio, especially through the years and turbulent economic times. So it's really a testament to your uh, creativity and your uh, discipline and the effort uh, you've put in. And so it's it's very, very impressive. Uh, I want to take your class, actually. So I don't oh, know if you, you have any class. video video classes online still. Um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I know I love dancing myself. I actually still teach dancing, um, at a ballet studio. I teach basic ballet to adults. Um, and some, sometimes you're so tired that, you know, you, you, you feel like, oh no, I can't do this anymore. But then the music starts and uh, you're with the students and you're actually moving to music it's and it's, it's what it's all about. And afterwards, I always say, I'm so glad I'm doing this. But sometimes, especially as the years go on, it's harder and harder to get yourself up to to do the class sometimes. So um, really, it, your hat's off to you for, for sustaining the studio or actually even taking over the studio and making it your own. And, 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 you know, following up on what Sherry just said is, you know, um, why Berkeley? You, you know, you mentioned that you've been in Berkeley for a long time. And, you know, I, ha you know, I, I can't give enough praise to that city because I loved it. And I, you know, spent many years there going to college. But um, why Berkeley, Roger? Well, what, what is it about and the location of your studio, which is right near this where they're renovating and there's all these shops and everything looks so great. And you're not too far away from the San Francisco Bay. Um, why Berkeley and, you know, why, why, why the beat where it is today? Well, you just said it. It's, it's the location uh, and the people. I, I, I love the Bay Area. Uh, and when I first moved here, it was Oakland. And, you know, and, and I enjoyed where I was staying when I was in Oakland. When I moved to Berkeley, it, it just, it felt like home. You know, I mean, I've traveled. I had the opportunity to travel all over the world. And I always appreciate when I come back home and I don't own the house I live in, but I've lived in it for 46 years. And so to me, that is my refuge and, um, we're near everything. I mean, we, we're close to Redwoods. San Francisco is just across the Bay. You know, we have the, the, the mountains, we have the sea, we have the Bay, all these things are factors, but Berkeley is just a wonderful place to be. I love it. <laughs> I, I you think, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, Sherry, you go. go. Well, no, I just, I mean, it's probably going to be a long answer, but I'm curious to know how you approach school kids and dancing. Um, because of course there are kids who already have sort of a natural ability, but there are, there are those who, who don't. So how do you spark the interest for these little, little people? Well, first of all, I give them a voice. And I teach them how to be able to um, see the world with just using their, their senses, their eyes. So mm. I, I first make them aware of all the different intelligences they use to be able to process. So visually, auditorily, mm. aesthetically, analytically. And so we do, I, I actually put together um, um a lesson plan for mm -hmm. each class that is kind of like a script. And it basically um, shows what we're going to do from the beginning to the end. And we'll get introductions and uses all these different activities mm -hmm. that's engaging, 
that that helps them to be able to do only visual things, to be able to only rely on being able to use their eyes to be able to take in information and or only using their ears. So no talking, no, no, no. just being able to see and hear and feel patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I have a, a line of inquiry, which is the question that is going to be the over the umbrella of the things we're going to be covering mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. O- over all sessions. But then I have guiding questions that the, the activities are created around, and those are the lens and the threads that go back into the lot of inquiry. And so it's everything is reinforced, you know, and, uh, and, and this method, the kids love it because like, um, it's their own creativity, right? Oh, you, know, you know, there's no wrong answers. It's all open ended. And so it, it really, really helps them to be better listeners, right? Be able to be more attentive, being able to use their eyes. And the most difficult thing is silence, being able to be still. Normally, being, that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> and so, you know, all the classes reinforce all these things visually, auditorily, you know, cool. both, you know, and then, embody, you know, embodying all these different qualities. That's very cool. And, you know, um, I have to say, observing both of you, that, you know, it's really a credit to both of you and your hard work um, to uh, have established careers in the arts. So um, I want to ask this question of both Sherry and Roger. If you have to give advice to younger people who are going to be watching this video on the show on Think Tech Hawaii, um, what advice would you give them in terms of they, you know, they're like a high school kid and they want to go into the arts professionally? Well, what advice? And you know, we, we don't have much time left, but short advice. Um, and let's start with Sherry and then go to Roger. Um, I would encourage it, but tell them that it's hard. It's hard work. But I would, if they want to do it, I have support them all the way. And I did it. Uh, I also uh, did all that in that it's very, very difficult. You know, uh, it's it's hard to see how a person sees himself as being successful, for example. And so what happens is we tend to make goals for ourselves that are too hard for us to achieve. It's, you know, when you, when you want something, you have to work for it, but don't be so hard on yourself. Do it in increments, set goals that are easy to be, uh, achieved and you, you can succeed because once you get to a certain stage, you can look back and you can say, oh, I was there, but now I'm here. And so, but if you make it too high, too far, the, one of the problems I find is the children are too impatient. If you don't, if they don't get it instantly. They don't want to do it. Oh, I'm bored. Uh, I don't like this. It's too hard. You know, nothing comes easy. But if you work on it, you can set your sights on something and you can achieve anything that you go for. So I would just say, if you want to dance, dance. And that's a great way to segue to the end of this show because you're dancing into the studio, um, <laughs> Sir Roger Dillahunty. Thank you, co-host Sherry Nakamura. Um, this is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind for Think Tech Hawaii. Um, uh, hui ho and aloha to all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Sherry.